Francis Noah Dona of the Shinnecock tribe of the Algonquin Nation will guide you back in time. Yes, way back through the highways heavy with traffic and the fields and meadows now covered with houses. Yes, back to the time when our island was covered with deep green forests and golden meadows as far as the eye could see and beyond. It was then that the crystal brooks and sparkling lakes bubbled joyously with trout and salmon. There is a place at the foot of a high bank on the shore of Noyak Bay where a spring bubbles forth. It was one of the finest mineral springs on Pamanak, the Indian name of Long Island. Hundreds of years ago, the Indians came to this watering place from far and wide across the great island. Here they built their summer camps near the shore of a crescent beach. The place is known as Wekatuk, which in the Algonquin language means at the end of the woods. And the spring had come to be called the Enchanted Spring of Wekatuk, for such were the wonders of the mysterious spells and marvelous enchantments that surround the legend of the enchanted spring. The quiet beauty of Wekatuk had once been a refuge, not only for the Indians, but for the animals of the forest and the birds of the air as well. Timid deer roamed through the leaf-covered woods, and squirrels and puppock swags, or rabbits as they are nowadays called, rustled through the tall grasses and mountain laurel. High in the trees, the chokensuck sang his shrill song, and here the great North American Wamsuck Pukunag often rested and plumed its feathers, while in the uppermost boughs of the windswept oak trees lining the shore, the keen-eyed osprey kept watch over land and sea. Wild bees swung and buzzed, while in the gleaming shallows, lilies and rushes waved gently in the breeze. The voices of my people have been silenced by the grave, but softly in the night of the full moon when the frost is on the meadow and quiet haunts the air, the echo of distant voices murmurs from the forest, floating on the tide of the timeless waters of Noyak Bay. before the coming of the white man that the three brothers Noah Dona, 
how Catatuck and Wyandank met for conclave and there established the confederacy of the four Indian tribes of eastern Long Island. Mama Weeter, Sachem of the Kachogs, also joined them. There, at the brink of the spring, they smoked the pipe of peace and quaffed refreshing draughts from the spring. Now it so happened that the powers of the spring were such that, according to the old beliefs, if thanks were given to Pampagusset, the spirit dwelling in the spring, a blessing would be imparted to the drinker of the enchanted waters. And this would, as indeed it had, so affect the brain as to give skill and judgment in guiding a skiff and so powerful a spell that if the prow of a newly launched canoe be sprinkled with the water by the hand of a maiden, that canoe would be lucky in fishing, sports, or war, and its owner invulnerable against all adversity. If this enchanted water were offered to the sick by an old squaw or weeny sunk, as they used to say, it had the power of curing fevers, as soon we shall see. brothers had gathered round the fire at the brink of the spring, a spell of enchantment descended from the dark of night. As they sat in contemplation, the spring began to bubble furiously and it glowed intensely with an eerie incandescence. Suddenly, and this startled the three graves, a strange and terrifying figure arose from the spring and leaped forth. It danced about wildly, shaking itself violently, splashing water on the three brothers, who were too startled to move. When they realized, however, that this was none other than Pampagusset, they rejoiced and danced with him in thanksgiving for the many wonders he had bestowed through the waters of the enchanted spring. When the dance had ended, the spirit disappeared. All departed except Pocatatuck, who camped for the night close to the spring, with the spring murmuring softly, and the waters of the bay lapping gently at the shore. The stillness of the night was broken only by the occasional hoot of the owl and the restless chirping of crickets. Pocatatuck wrapped him 
himself in his blanket and was soon fast asleep. During the night, he had a strange and most wonderful dream. the western sky. Great streaks of crimson clutched skyward from the east. Soon the treetops were etched in gold, and the first rising gulls greeted the dawn of a new day. Wackatuck had become a favorite place of Pocatatuck. The forest abounded with wild game, and the waters of the bay were plentiful in fish, clams, and scallops. But in addition to all this, it was beside the enchanted spring where the young brave first met a beautiful Indian princess who lived on Manhansarahakwa Shawanak, an island sheltered by islands far out in the bay. Her name was Ashwa. On her island home, Ashwa often ran through clovered meadows to reach the highest hill where she would spend many hours pondering the strange but wonderful feeling that now filled her heart. The sight of a distant canoe would light her face with joy. In happiness, she sang her first love song to the intoxicating breezes that announced the advent of spring. Thank you. 
Pokhalatuk journeyed in his canoe to meet Ashwar on the shore of her island. With plumes of swans down on his head and foxtails on his moccasined feet, he would often sing of his love for Ashwar as he guided his canoe straight and true across the waters of the bay. Perhaps, he thought, she would hear his song, or a hungry osprey, on hearing it, might interrupt its hunt and fly away to the island, telling Ashwa of the arrival of her brave young lover. grew in wisdom and strength, for he was one day to become a great sachem and leader of his people. And it came to pass that before Pokhatatuk and Ashwar were to live together as man and wife, a great ceremony would be held. filled the air. The forest and woodlands were carpeted in soft laurel clusters of pink and white.
Peshwar appeared at her wigwam, bowing gracefully to all present. None had ever seen a more beautiful princess. She wore a dress of white deerskin, and her hair was arranged in bangs, denoting her state of maidenhood. Polkatatuk joined her, and together they walked to the place of honor. With all solemnity, Polkatatuk took hold of a leather quiver filled with the water of the enchanted spring. He presented it to Ashwa to drink, saying, Kuj Kwamamish, holding the quiver to her gold-painted lips, Ashwa drank deeply of the enchanted water. She then walked to the shore where Pokatatuk's canoe stood ready for launching. Murmuring the magic word, Jia, Ashwa poured the remaining water over the prow of the canoe and was thus certain that her lover would be safe and brave in all voyages and adventures. Ashwa returned to the place of honor while Pokatatuk prepared for the great ritual dance of courtship. As a torrent of sound pulsed from a hundred drums, Pokatatuk leaped in the air as the flames of the fires licked at his body. He danced in savage splendor.
of all the gifts bestowed upon man by the deity, perhaps none has been more gratefully received than the gift of water. In the murmuring fountain and bubbling stream are carried the precious traces of forgotten cultures. Such waters quench not the thirst of the body, but of the spirit. It happened with the Indians, as it did with many of the ancient peoples, that strange and wonderful powers were attributed to the life-giving waters. The waters of the enchanted spring once flowed clean and fresh from the fertile womb of nature, unpolluted by the malevolent spirit of so-called civilized man that was later to overtake and destroy the Indian culture of the continent. The giving of water was highly esteemed among the Indians. It is said the custom of launching ships with wine or water stems from this ancient practice. Wyakaboni, the Indian prince of the Montaukets, could give no richer gift to his guardian who was lord of the Isle of Manchinoc than a few drops of the water from the enchanted spring of Wekatak. At a place on a hill where the earth meets the sky, the ancient squaw Tiana once lived. How many years ago? No one yet alive remembers. Her life and work would have remained forgotten and unsung were it not for the mothers and children of this ancient burg who listened and repeated the story of Tiana around the glowing hearth fires during the cold winter nights many centuries ago. In sifting through the archives of time, the story of Tiana reveals the courage and bravery of an individual woman and her concern for her people. Tiana lived in a wooden lodge situated on a majestic bluff overlooking a bay. In early childhood, she found the world about her to be a wonderland of beauty. As she walked through woodlands and meadows, along pebble beaches and wandering inlets, she was filled with endless questions. In exploring the mysteries of a seashell or the design of a dogwood blossom, Tiana entered the great university of nature.
she observed the change of seasons, the growth of plants and the ways of birds and animals. Tiana realized the world must indeed be guided by a divine hand. When she was old enough to paddle a canoe, or katanak, as the Indians call them, Tiana explored the bays and creeks to see what adventure awaited in some unseen part of the landscape. At other times, she set out to explore a distant island that sparkled like a ribbon of gold in the western sky. And always she would return home, her canoe heavy with treasure, perhaps freshly dug clams, unusual wildflowers, or delicate shells in pastel colors that would later be woven into wampum. During the spring and summer months, the meadows abounded with wild berries, and Tiana joined the birds and animals in feasting on this delicious harvest. The Indian men dangerous and exciting hunt for the mighty whale. The women, however, taught their daughters the arts of wampum and pottery making, together with the responsibility of caring for the vegetable garden. Such were the ways of the Indians. There were times then, as even now, when all was not peaceful, when the storm clouds of pestilence gathered in twisting spirals over the land, blotting out the golden sun. Tiana was known far and wide among the neighboring tribes as much for her kindness and beauty, as for her knowing ways with plants and animals. She had indeed guided many a weary traveler to the enchanted spring, located not far from her lodge. There, by the waters of Wekatuck, Tiana would lower the leather container called a Woolamokan, and with it draw forth the crystal waters from the spring. Here she often met with Anabacus, the basket maker, who even in her later years preferred to gather the choicest reeds and grasses that grew beside the waters of the enchanted spring. Indians from the 13 tribes of the island met there to exchange accounts of the past winter or renew acquaintances and to quaff the waters of the spring.
as the midsummer sun reclined on a cloud-filled horizon, Tiana stood by her lodge, contemplating the serene beauty of the bay. As she gazed upon the waters, her attention was diverted by a solitary figure making its way along the shore. And as the figure approached the steep embankment below her lodge, Tiana recognized at once the basket maker, Anabacus, who now called to her in distress. The old squaw labored under the burden of the sad news she had to relate. A young brave had journeyed from Montauk, falling exhausted in the meadow beyond the enchanted spring. Anabacus had by chance found him, half dead and burning with fever. Reviving him with the waters of the spring, Anabacus learned of a terrible malady that had fallen upon their neighbors, the Montaukets. In desperation, they had dispatched their strongest and swiftest brave to carry the message for help to Princess Tiana, who somehow they knew would help them through the strength of her potions and the magic of the waters of the enchanted spring. When Tiana heard of the tragedy, she rushed to her lodge and gathered a bundle of herbs and medicines. She threw a blanket trimmed with goose quills over her head, fastened shut the door of her lodge, and according to Indian custom, climbed out through the chimney opening. Upon reaching the beach, Tiana launched her canoe and paddled swiftly to the nearby spring of Wakatuk. As she drew the waters from the spring, she muttered an incantation to the spirit of Pampaguset that he bestow his blessing on the waters and save her people from illness and death. Tiana carried the water-filled quivers to her canoe, and without a moment's hesitation, once again set out on the journey to Montauk. She sailed through coves and harbors to the deep and open waters of the bay. The voyage was both long and dangerous. The swift running tides and magnetic cross currents tossed her canoe at whim. But Tiana would not be deterred from her course. With even greater determination, she guided her canoe eastward.
she approached the sheltered waters of Concaga Bay at Montauk. In a loud voice, she called, Natum Pog, Natum Pog, Akan Muk Notasham, Kutasham, Wutatash, Mormon, Tayantash. Friends, friends, hear me. I come from across the sea. I bring you the waters of the enchanted spring. Drink and be of good health. As Tiana reached the shore, cries were heard in the woodlands. <laughs> the faces of braves and squaws were covered with secret or ashes, as was the custom when in mourning for the dead. Terror had seized the tribe. The chief had already died, and the tribe was without hope or direction. Funeral mounds were everywhere. A squaw sat moaning on the ground, still holding the lifeless body of her papoose. Tiana's presence helped to relieve the terror of the Indians. As she went about administering to the sick and giving comfort to those who had lost their dear ones, hope was restored. And soon the sick likewise returned to good health and well-being. But for Tiana, her work was not yet finished. The terrible sickness had spread to yet another tribe living on an island in the bay. The Montaukets employed Tiana to bring the enchanted waters to their brothers on the island. With the last of the water from Wekatuk, Tiana once again pointed her canoe to the open waters of the bay. Even as the shores of the Montaukets were still in view, great storm clouds gathered in the sky, and ocean wind pushed the white-capped waves into a mountainous sea. The sky suddenly broke open with a torrential rain. Great drums of thunder pounded in the sky as of lightning were hurled seaward. With a deafening roar, a mountain of water crashed down on Tiana, throwing her canoe end over end. Submerged in the churning waters, Tiana grabbed desperately for a lifeline to safety. She caught hold of an empty quiver and managed to float to the surface. For what seemed an eternity, she rode the crest of each wave and survived the downward pull of the undertow that threatened to swallow her. The storm released its grip on the sky and sea as quickly as it had begun. thanksgiving for being yet alive. Several canoes paddled swiftly to her rescue. When she again reached the shores of Montau, Tiana was wrapped in blankets and cared for by the squaws. were lighted, 
Tiana was escorted to the place of honor in the hope that the island tribesmen might yet be spared from the evil malady and in thanksgiving for the deliverance of Tiana, a ritual ceremony was held. light of dawn on the following morning, a party of braves was dispatched from the shore in a large hunting canoe. The fate of their island brothers must be known at all costs. Throughout the day, women and children gathered in the hills of Monta, keeping watch on the horizon for signs of the returning canoe. When in late afternoon the party of braves could be seen approaching the waters of Concaga Bay, everyone gathered anxiously at the shore. As if a dagger had at once rendered the stillness of the warm summer air, a piercing cry plunged across the waters. Manchanak! Manchanak! I cannot translate the terror, the horror, the fear and desolation conjured by that fateful word, Manchanak. Some have said it means the land of the departed, or they have all gone away. But from that day onward, the island was known as Manchinok, the Isle of the Dead. With a heart heavy with sadness, Tiana gave a last farewell to the Montaukets. She returned to Wekatuck in dignity and quiet resignation, strengthened by the knowledge that through her efforts, those departed would be forever remembered by the living. On a hill where the earth meets the sky, the waters of the enchanted spring can still be heard carried high on the breeze. When the dogwood is in blossom in the forest and the fields of Anabacus are once more dipped in summer green, the voice of Tiana calls. 